Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 40, Transcendentalism, Sojourner Truth, and Commodore Perry. As are all things in life, history also needs to look through a different lens of diversity. This is not to be at the expense of the established history. I affectionately refer to traditional historical accounts as DWDs, or Dead White Dudes. As the social justice movements keep racial injustice at the forefront of the cultural conversation, Storytelling needs to focus on the positive and negative representation of other sub-branches of history. History that goes beyond framing minority experiences as underdog tales offers lessons for historians on how to rethink their inclusivity ambitions. The ability to build diverse and collective historical accounts may be the most critical educational skill of the decade. We need to embrace differences and equip people to learn about their past better. Unfortunately, the standard way of viewing diversity and inclusion historically often falls short. The need for historians that can adopt different perspectives has never been greater. Plus, tapping into a wide array of people's stories and events will become more critical as the world becomes more complex and the pace of just about everything accelerates. When we dig beneath the surface and we get to what matters most to people, we can find common ground with those who, on the surface, would appear to be quite different. Not everyone sees things the same way, and that's a good thing. As historians, we need to appreciate the leverage these different perspectives give us to achieve our goals of a complete account of history. Transcendentalism Transcendentalism is a 19th century school of American theological and intellectual thinking that mixed regard for nature and autonomy with Unitarianism and German Romanticism components. Writer Ralph Waldo Emerson was the primary practitioner of the Crusade, which existed loosely in Massachusetts in the early 1800s before becoming an organized group in the 1830s. Transcendentalism has its origins in New England in the early 1800s and the birth of Unitarianism. It was born from a debate between New Light theologians, who believed that religion should focus on an emotional experience, and Old Light opponents, who valued reason in their religious approach. These Old Lights became known first as liberal Christians and then as Unitarians and were defined by the belief that there was no trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as in traditional Christian faith and that Jesus Christ was immortal. Various philosophies began to swirl around this crowd. The ideas that would become transcendentalism split from Unitarianism over its perceived rationality and instead embraced German Romanticism to seek a more spiritual experience. Thinkers in the movement embraced ideas brought forth by philosophers Immanuel Kant and Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, ancient Indian scripture known as the Vedas, and religious founder Immanuel Swedenborg. Transcendentalists endorsed the idea of personal knowledge of God, believing that no arbitrator was required for spiritual understanding. They welcomed idealism, focusing on nature and fighting materialism. By the 1830s, literature began to appear that bound the transcendentalist ideas together in a cohesive way and marked the origins of a more organized movement. On September 12, 1836, four Harvard University alumni, writer and banger, Maine, Minister Frederick Henry Hodge, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Unitarian ministers George Ripley and George Putnam, left a celebration of the bicentennial of Harvard to meet at Willard's Hotel in Cambridge. The purpose was to follow up on correspondence between Hodge and Emerson and to talk about the state of Unitarianism and what they could do about it. The four met again at Ripley's house in Boston one week later. This was a more critical group meeting that included many Unitarian ministers, intellectuals, writers, and reformers. There would be 30 more meetings of the Transcendental Club over the next four years, featuring a shifting membership that always included Emerson, Ripley, and Hodge. The meeting's only rule was that no one would be permitted to attend if their presence deterred the group from discussing a topic. Emerson's essay Nature, published in 1836, 
presented Transcendentalist philosophy as it had formed in the club meetings. This group ceased to meet in 1840 but was involved in the publication The Dial, at first guided by a member and pioneering feminist Margaret Fuller and later by Emerson, to address Transcendentalist thought and concerns. Henry David Thoreau got his start in The Dial, writing on wildlife in Massachusetts. After its demise in 1844, Thoreau moved to Walden Pond, where he wrote his most famous work, Walden, or Life in the Woods. Inspired by different ideological groups like the Shakers, members of the Transcendental Club were interested in forming a commune to put their ideas to the test. In 1841, a small group of them, including author Nathaniel Hawthorne, moved to Brook Farm in West Roxbury, Massachusetts. The venture, helmed by George Ripley, was covered in the pages of the dial as an idyllic one that involved farm work by day and creative work by candlelight at night. Emerson never joined the farm. He approved of the commune but didn't want to give up his privacy, preferring to be a frequent visitor. Thoreau refused to join as well, finding the entire idea unattractive. Margaret Fuller visited but felt the farm was destined for failure. The farm was run by members buying shares for lifelong membership, guaranteeing an annual return on their investment, and allowing members who could not afford a share to compensate with work. As farmers, they were newcomers, but Hawthorne was thrilled by the physicality of farming life. There was also a boarding school on site that was the farm's primary income source. The farm proved successful enough that members had to build new homes on the property to house everyone in its first year. There were over 100 residents. In 1844, following a restructuring that brought further growth, the commune began to fall into a slow decline, with members becoming disillusioned by its mission, financial challenges, and other problems and squabbling amongst themselves. By 1847, philosophers had finished this transcendentalist experiment. As the 1850s arrived, transcendentalism is believed to have lost some of its pull, notably following the untimely death of Margaret Fuller in an 1850 shipwreck. Though its members remained active in the public eye, notably Emerson, Thoreau, and others in their shared opposition to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, following the failure of Brook Farm, it never again materialized as a cohesive group. Sojourner Truth Born Isabella Born Free, Sojourner Truth was an American abolitionist and women's rights activist. Truth was born into slavery in Swartikill, New York, but escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. After going to court to recover her son in 1828, she became the first black woman to win a case against a white man. She gave herself the name Sojourner Truth in 1843 after she became convinced that God had called her to leave the city and go into the countryside, testifying the hope that was in her. Her best-known speech was delivered extemporaneously, in 1851, at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. During the Civil War, the speech became widely known by the title Ain't I a Woman? A variation of the original speech rewritten by someone else using a stereotypical southern dialect. In contrast, Sojourner Truth was from New York and grew up speaking Dutch as her first language. Truth helped recruit black troops for the Union Army, after the war, she tried unsuccessfully to secure land grants from the federal government for formerly enslaved people. She continued to fight on behalf of women and African Americans until her death. Truth was one of the twelve children born to James and Elizabeth Bormfree. Charles Hardenberg inherited his father's estate, and continued to enslave people as a part of that estate's property. Colonel Hardenberg bought James and Elizabeth born free from slave traders and kept their family at his estate in a big hilly area in Esopus, New York, 95 miles north of New York City. When Charles Hardenberg died in 1806, nine-year-old Truth was sold at an auction with a flock of sheep for $100 to John Neely near Kingston, New York. Until that time, Truth spoke only Dutch, and after learning English, she spoke it with a Dutch accent. She later described Neely as cruel and harsh, relating how he beat her daily, even with a bundle of rods. In 1808 Neely sold her for $105 to tavern keeper Martinus Shriver of Port Ewan, New York, who owned her for 18 months. Shriver then sold Truth in 1810 to John Dumont of West Park, New York. John Dumont raped her repeatedly, and significant tension existed between Truth and Dumont's wife, Elizabeth Waring Dumont, who harassed her and made her life more difficult. Around 1815, 
Truth met and fell in love with an enslaved man named Robert from a neighboring farm. Robert's owner forbade their relationship, he did not want the enslaved people to have children with people he was not enslaving because he would not own the children. One day Robert sneaked over to see Truth. When his owner and son found him, they savagely beat Robert until Dumont finally intervened. Truth never saw Robert again after that day, and he died a few years later. The experience haunted Truth throughout her life. Truth eventually married an older enslaved man named Thomas. She bore five children, James, her firstborn, who died in childhood, Diana, the result of a rape, by John Dumont, and Peter, Elizabeth, and Sophia, all born after she and Thomas united. In 1799, the state of New York began to legislate the abolition of slavery, although emancipating those people enslaved in New York was not complete until July 4, 1827. Dumont had promised to grant Truth her freedom a year before the state emancipation if she would do well and be faithful. However, he changed his mind, claiming a hand injury had made her less productive. She was outraged but resumed working, spinning 100 pounds of wool to fulfill her sense of commitment to him. Late in 1826, Truth escaped to freedom with her infant daughter, Sophia. She had to leave her other children behind because their masters did not legally free them in the Emancipation Order until they had served as bound servants into their twenties. She later said, I did not run off, for I thought that wicked, but I walked off, believing that to be all right. She found her way to the home of Isaac and Maria Van Wagenen in New Paltz, who took her and her baby in. She lived there until the New York State Emancipation Act was approved. Isaac offered to buy her services for the remainder of the year until the state's emancipation took effect, which Dumont accepted for $20. Truth learned that her son Peter, then five years old, had been sold by Dumont and then illegally resold to an owner in Alabama. With the help of the Van Wagenens, she took the issue to court, and in 1828, after months of legal proceedings, she got back her son, who had been abused by those enslaving him. Truth became one of the first black women to court against a white man and won the case. Truth had a life-changing religious experience during her stay with the Van Wagenen, and became a devout Christian. In 1829 she moved with her son Peter to New York City, where she worked as a housekeeper for Elijah Pearson, a Christian evangelist. While in New York, she befriended Mary Simpson, a grocer on John Street who claimed George Washington had once enslaved her. They shared an interest in charity for the poor and became intimate friends. In 1832, she met Robert Matthews, also known as Prophet Matthias, and went to work for him as a housekeeper at the Matthias Kingdom Communal Colony. Elijah Pearson died, and Robert Matthews and Truth were accused of stealing from and poisoning him. Both were acquitted of the murder, though Matthews was convicted of lesser crimes, served time, and moved west. In 1839, Truth's son Peter took a job on a whaling ship called the Zone of Nantucket. From 1840 to 1841, she received three letters from him, though he told her he had sent five in his third letter. Peter said he also never received any of her letters. When the ship returned to port in 1842, Peter was not on board, and Truth never heard from him again. The year 1843 was a turning point for Sojourner. She became a Methodist, and on June 1, Pentecost Sunday, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. She chose the name because she heard the Spirit of God calling on her to preach the truth. She told her friends, the Spirit calls me, and I must go, and left to make her way traveling and preaching about the abolition of slavery. Taking along only a few possessions in a pillowcase, she traveled north, working her way up through the Connecticut River Valley towards Massachusetts. At that time, Truth began attending Millerite Adventist camp meetings. Millerites followed the teachings of William Miller of New York, who preached that Jesus would appear in 1844, bringing about the end of the world. Many in the Millerite community greatly appreciated Truth's preaching and singing, and she drew large crowds when she spoke. Like many others disappointed when the anticipated second coming did not arrive, Truth distanced herself from her Millerite friends for a time. In 1844, she joined the Northampton Association of Education and Industry in Florence, Massachusetts. The organization was founded by abolitionists and supported women's rights, religious tolerance, and pacifism. In 
In its four and a half year history, there were 240 members, though no more than 120 at any one time. While there, Truth met William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and David Ruggles. They lived on 470 acres, raising livestock, running a sawmill, a gristmill, and a silk factory. Truth lived and worked in the community and oversaw the laundry, supervising men and women. Encouraged by the community, Truth delivered her first anti-slavery speech that year. In 1846, the group disbanded, unable to support itself. In 1845, she joined the household of George Benson, the brother-in-law of William Lloyd Garrison. In 1849, she visited John Dumont before he moved west. Truth started dictating her memoirs to her friend Olive Gilbert, and in 1850 William Lloyd Garrison privately published her book, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth, A Northern Slave. That same year, she purchased a home in Florence for $300 and spoke at the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. Truth dedicated her life to fighting for an equal society for African Americans and women, including abolition, voting rights, and property rights. She was at the vanguard of efforts to address intersecting social justice issues. When black women like Truth spoke of ownership, they mixed their ideas with challenges to slavery and racism. Truth told her own stories, ones that suggested that a women's movement might take another direction, one that championed the broad interests of all humanity. In 1856, Truth bought a neighboring lot in Northampton, but she did not keep the new property for long. On September 3, 1857, she sold all her possessions, new and old, to Daniel Ives and moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, where she rejoined former members of the Millerite movement who had formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Anti-slavery activities had begun early in Michigan and Ohio. Here, she also joined the nucleus of the Michigan abolitionists, the Progressive Friends, some of whom she had already met at national conventions. From 1857 to 1867, Truth lived in the village of Harmonia, Michigan, a spiritualist utopia. She moved into nearby Battle Creek, Michigan, living at her home on 38 College Street until she died in 1883. According to the 1860 census, her household in Harmonia included her daughter, Elizabeth Banks, and her grandsons, James Caldwell and Sammy Banks. In 1858, someone interrupted a speech and accused her of being a man, Truth opened her blouse and revealed her breasts. Truth helped recruit black troops for the Union Army during the Civil War. Her grandson, James Caldwell, enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. In 1864, Truth was employed by the National Freedmen's Relief Association in Washington, D.C., where she worked diligently to improve conditions for African Americans. In October of that year, she met President Abraham Lincoln. In 1865, while working at the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, Truth rode in the streetcars to help force their desegregation. Truth is credited with writing a song, The Valiant Soldiers, for the 1st Michigan Colored Regiment, it was said to be composed during the war and sung by her in Detroit and Washington, D.C. It is sung to the tune of John Brown's Body or the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Although Truth claims to have written the words, it has been debated. In 1867, Truth moved from Harmonia to Battle Creek. In 1868, she traveled to western New York, visited with Amy Post, and resumed touring all over the East Coast. At a speaking engagement in Florence, Massachusetts, after returning from a very tiring trip when churches called Truth upon to speak, she stood up and said, Children, I have come here like the rest of you, to hear what I have to say. In 1870, Truth tried to secure land grants from the federal government for formerly enslaved people, which she pursued for seven years without success. While in Washington, D.C., she had a meeting with President Ulysses S. Grant in the White House. In 1872, she returned to Battle Creek, became active in Grant's presidential re-election campaign, and even tried to vote on election day but was turned away at the polling place. Truth spoke about abolition, women's rights, and prison reform and preached to the Michigan legislature against capital punishment. Not everyone welcomed her lecturing and speeches, but she had many friends and staunch support from many influential people at the time. Truth was cared for by two of her daughters in the last years of her life. Several days before Sojourner Truth died, 
a reporter came from the Grand Rapids Eagle to interview her. Her face was drawn and emaciated, and she was suffering great pain. Her eyes were very bright and mind alert, although it was difficult for her to talk. Truth died early in the morning on November 26, 1883, at her Battle Creek home. On November 28, 1883, her funeral was held at the Congregational Presbyterian Church, officiated by its pastor, the Reverend Reed Stewart. Some of the notable citizens of Battle Creek acted as pallbearers, nearly 1,000 people attended the service. Truth was buried in the city's Oak Hill Cemetery. Commodore Matthew Perry The Perry expedition was a diplomatic and military excursion to the Tokugawa shogunate, concerning two distinct voyages by warships of the United States Navy in 1853. The goals of this expedition included exploration, surveying, and the establishment of diplomatic relations and negotiation of trade deals with various nations of the region. Opening contact with the government of Japan was considered a top priority of the expedition and was one of the key reasons for its inception. Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry commanded the expedition under orders from President Millard Fillmore. Perry's primary goal was to end Japan's 220-year-old policy of isolation and open Japanese ports to American trade through gunboat diplomacy if required. The Perry expedition led directly to the establishment of diplomatic relations between Japan and the Western Great Powers and ultimately to the destruction of the ruling Tokugawa shogunate and the rehabilitation of the emperor. Following the expedition, Japan's burgeoning trade routes with the world led to the cultural trend in which parts of Japanese culture influenced art in Europe and America. Growing commerce between America and China, the presence of American whalers in waters off Japan, and the increasing monopolization of possible coaling stations by European colonial powers in Asia were all contributing factors in the decision by President Fillmore to dispatch an expedition to Japan. The Americans were also driven by concepts of manifest destiny and the desire to impose the benefits of Western civilization and the Christian religion on what they perceived as backward Asian nations. Between 1790 and 1853, at least 27 U.S. ships visited Japan, only to be turned away. By the early 19th century, the Japanese policy of isolation was increasingly under challenge. In 1844, Dutch King William II sent a letter urging Japan to end the isolation policy on its own before other countries would force the change from the outside. There were increased sightings and forays of foreign ships into Japanese waters, which led to a significant inner debate in Japan on how best to meet this potential menace to Japan's economic and political dominance. In May 1851, American Secretary of State Daniel Webster authorized Commodore John H. Orlick, commander of the American East India Squadron, to return 17 shipwrecked Japanese sailors residing in San Francisco, which might provide the opportunity for opening commercial relations with Japan. On May 10, 1851, Webster drafted a letter addressed to the Japanese emperor with guarantees that the expedition had no religious purpose but was only to request friendship, commerce, and supplies of coal needed by American ships en route to China. The letter also boasted of American growth across the North American continent and its technological prowess and was signed by President Fillmore. However, Orlick became involved in a diplomatic row with a Brazilian diplomat and quarrels with the captain of his flagship and was relieved of his command before he could undertake the Japan expedition his replacement, Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry, was a senior ranking officer in the United States Navy and had ample diplomatic experience. Perry was aware of the tribulations implicated in establishing relations with Japan and initially protested that he would prefer to command the Mediterranean squadron of the U.S. Navy instead of being assigned to yet another attempt to open Japan, which he considered unlikely to succeed. In advance of his voyage, Perry read widely amongst available books about Japan. His research also included consultation with the renowned Japanologist Philip Franz von Siebold. Siebold spent eight years working, teaching, and studying at the isolated Dutch island trading post of Dejima in Nagasaki Harbor before returning to Leiden in the Netherlands. Perry also demanded greater latitude in his orders from Webster, a demand the Secretary of State granted just before his death in October 1852. Perry thus sailed for Japan with full and discretionary powers, including the possible use of force if the Japanese tried to treat him as they had the unfortunate Commodore Biddle, 
Perry also declined to allow any professional diplomats to attend the expedition. He asked the German painter Wilhelm Heiner and pioneer photographer Eliphalet M. Brown Jr. to join the journey as official artists. The U.S. State Department assigned agricultural specialist Dr. James Morrow. Several Japanese pariahs were also taken on as unofficial interpreters. The expedition was assigned the steam warships Mississippi, Susquehanna, and Powhatan, the armed store steamships Lexington, Supply, Southampton, and the Macedonian sailing sloops Plymouth and Saratoga. To command his fleet, Perry chose officers he had served in the Mexican-American War. Commander Franklin Buchanan was captain of Susquehanna, and Joel Abbott was captain of Macedonian. Commander Henry A. Adams became the Commodore's chief of staff with the title captain of the fleet. Major Jacob Zalin was the ranking marine officer and was stationed in Mississippi. Perry also received permission to take government stores as gifts for the natives, especially outdated small arms. These included 40 hall rifles, 20 percussion pistols, 20 artillery swords, 20 muskets with Maynard percussion locks, 40 light cavalry sabers, and 100 Colt revolvers. Perry chose the black-hulled paddle-wheeled Mississippi as his flagship and cleared Hampton Roads, Virginia, on November 24, 1852. Perry made port calls at Madeira, St. Helena, Cape Town, Mauritius, Ceylon, Singapore, Macau, and Hong Kong. He met with American-born Sinologist Samuel Wells Williams, who provided Chinese-language translations of Perry's official letters, and rendezvoused with Plymouth and Saratoga. He continued to Shanghai, where he met with the Dutch-born American diplomat Anton L. C. Portman, who translated his official letters into the Dutch language and rendezvoused with Susquehanna. Perry then switched his flag to Susquehanna and called on the Ryukyu Islands from May 17. Ignoring the claims of Satsuma Domain to the islands, as well as his orders, he threatened and bluffed local authorities by threatening to attack with 200 troops unless he were allowed trading rights and land for a coaling station. Perry landed his marines, whom he drilled on the beach for hours, and demanded an audience with the Ryukyu King Shotai at Shuri Castle. Knowing that officials would report his every action to Japanese authorities in Edo, Perry carefully dodged meeting with low-ranked officials and used military ceremony and shipboard hospitality to display American military power and the peaceful intent of his expedition. Perry left with promises that the islands would be entirely open for trade with the United States. Continuing on the Ogosawara Islands in mid-June, Perry met with the local inhabitants and even purchased a plot of land. Perry finally reached Eureka at the entrance to Edo Bay in Japan on July 8, 1853. His fleet consisted of four vessels, Susquehanna, Mississippi, Plymouth, and Saratoga. As he arrived, Perry ordered his ships to steam past Japanese lines towards the capital of Edo and positioned their guns towards the town of Eureka. He also fired blank shots from his 73 cannons, which he claimed were celebrating American Independence Day. Perry's ships were equipped with New Pekin's shell guns, cannons capable of wreaking great explosive destruction with every shell. The American ships were almost surrounded by Japanese guard boats, however, Perry ordered that any attempt at boarding was to be repelled. One boat carried a large sign in French calling the American fleet to depart immediately. On July 9, a Yoriki from the Urega Bugio, Nakajima Seiburo Suk, accompanied by interpreter Hori Tatsuno Suk, rode out to Susquehanna but refused permission to come on board. After some negotiation, they were permitted to board, where they displayed the order that no foreign ships were allowed into Japanese ports. Perry remained in his cabin and refused to meet them, sending word through his officers that he would only deal with officials of sufficient stature and authority as he carried a letter from the President of the United States. On July 10, Yoriki Kayama Izeman, pretending to be the Urega Bugio, called on Susquehanna and was allowed to meet Captain Franklin, whom he advised to travel to Nagasaki, the designated port for all foreign contact. Kayama was told that unless a suitable official came to receive the document, Perry would land troops and march on Edo, to deliver the letter in person. Kayama asked for three days to respond. The actual Urega Bugio, Edo Hiramichi, sent a report to the Shogun and advised that his defenses were inadequate to repel the Americans by force. In the meantime, Perry began a campaign of intimidation by sending boats to survey the surrounding area and threatened to use force if the Japanese guard boats around the American squadron did not disperse. He also presented the Japanese with a white flag and a letter that told them that if they chose combat, the Americans would necessarily vanquish them, 
the Japanese government was paralyzed due to the incapacitation by the illness of Shogun Tokugawa Ayashi and by political indecision on how to handle the unprecedented threat to the nation's capital. On July 11, senior Royu Abe Masahiro temporized, deciding that simply accepting a letter from the Americans would not violate Japanese sovereignty. The decision was conveyed to Urega, and Perry was asked to move his fleet slightly southwest to the beach at Koehama, where he was allowed to land on July 14. Perry went ashore with considerable pomp, landing with 250 sailors and marines in 15 ships' boats after a 13-gun salute from Susquehanna. Major Zuilin's marines presented arms, and a band played Hail Columbia. President Fillmore's letter was formally received by Hatamoto Toda Izu no Kami Ujiyoshi and Ido Iwami no Kami Hiramichi. Perry's squadron eventually departed on July 17 for the Chinese coast, promising to return for a reply. Shogun Tokugawa Ayoshi died days after Perry's departure and was succeeded by his sickly young son, Tokugawa Kasada, leaving effective administration in the Council of Elders led by Abe Masahiro. After Perry's release, an extensive debate ensued within the shogunal court on responding to the Americans' implied threats. Abe felt that it was currently impossible for Japan to resist the American demands by military force and yet was reluctant to take any action under his authority for such an unprecedented situation. Attempting to legitimize any decision, Abe polled all the daimyos for their opinions. This was the first time that the Tokugawa shogunate had allowed its decision-making to be a matter of public debate and had the unforeseen consequence of portraying the shogunate as weak and indecisive. The poll results also failed to provide Abe with an answer, as of the 61 known responses, 19 favored accepting the American demands, and 19 were equally opposed. Of the remainder, 14 gave vague answers expressing concern about a possible war, 7 suggested making temporary concessions, and 2 advised that they would go along with whatever was decided. The only universal recommendation was to take steps immediately to bolster Japan's coastal defenses. The Japanese hurriedly built fortifications close to current Odaiba to protect Edo from a subsequent American naval incursion. Although having told the Japanese that he would return the following year, Perry soon learned that Russian Admiral Vice Admiral Yefimi Putyatin had called in at Nagasaki shortly after he departed from Edo Bay and had spent a month attempting to force the Japanese to sign a treaty before his return. He also was told by both the British and French that they intended to accompany him to Japan in the spring to ensure that the Americans did not obtain any exclusive privileges. Perry thus returned on February 13, 1854, with eight vessels and 1,600 men. The fleet had lost Plymouth of the original four and now also included, Lexington, Macedonian, Powhatan, Vandalia, and Southampton. Supply arrived loaded with coal and stores on March 19, bringing the total strength to nine. By Perry's return, the Tokugawa shogunate had decided to accept virtually all the demands in Fillmore's letter. However, Negotiators procrastinated for weeks over negotiations, with Perry insisting on Edo and the Japanese offering various other locations. Perry eventually lost his temper and threatened to bring 100 ships, more than the actual size of the US Navy at the time, within 20 days to war on Japan. Both sides eventually compromised on the tiny village of Yokohama, where a purpose-built hall was erected. Perry landed on March 8 with 500 sailors and marines in 27 ships' boats, with three bands playing the star-spangled banner. Three weeks of negotiation ensued, accompanied by diplomatic gestures such as exchanging state gifts. The Americans presented the Japanese with a miniature steam locomotive, a telegraph apparatus, various agricultural tools, small arms, and 100 gallons of whiskey, clocks, stoves, and books about the United States. The Japanese responded with gold lacquered furniture and boxes, bronze ornaments, silk and brocade garments, porcelain goblets, and a collection of seashells upon learning of Perry's hobby. Cultural displays were also performed on both sides, with the American sailors aboard the Powhatan putting on a minstrel show. In contrast, several high-ranking sumo wrestlers performed feats of strength and held exhibition matches. Finally, on March 31st, Perry signed the Convention of Kanagawa, which opened the ports of Shimoda and Hakodate to American ships, provided for the care of shipwrecked sailors, and established an American consulate in Shimoda. Perry then dispatched the Saratoga home with a signed treaty while the rest of the squadron surveyed Hakodate, Shimoda, and the site of the future consulate.
After departing from Shimoda, the fleet returned to the Ryukyu Islands, where Perry swiftly drafted the compact between the United States and the Ryukyu Kingdom, which was formally signed on July 11, 1854. The treaty was signed on the Japanese side by Hayashi Akira. After Perry returned to the United States in 1855, Congress voted to grant him $20,000 to appreciate his work in Japan. Perry used part of this money to prepare and publish a report of the expedition in three volumes, titled Narrative of the Expedition of an American Squadron to the China Seas and Japan. He was also promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral on the retired list when his health began to fail as a reward for his services. Perry was known to have suffered severe arthritis that left him in frequent pain, which prevented him from fulfilling his duties. Perry spent his last years preparing to publish his account of the Japan expedition, announcing its completion on December 28, 1857. Two days later, he was detached from his previous post, an assignment to the Naval Efficiency Board. He died awaiting further orders on March 4, 1858, of rheumatism that had spread to the heart, compounded by gout complications. You've been listening to the RPTM podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.